Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation to participate. It's been a terrific day, I have to say, and happy birthday to the department and the school. Um, so I guess I, would, I, in keeping with the theme of the symposium, I, I want to touch upon two wee stories from our own department around trans translational journeys. And I, I want to start with, um, with this figure. So this graph's taken from data provided publicly by NHMRC. Because I think actually it's a fun time to be in translational medicine. We've got a translational faculty in NHMRC. We've got a new um, academy of health and medical sciences. So it's a fun time to be a clinician scientist. It feels like our time has come. But I want to share these data with you. So these are NHMRC data. These are new funding from the year 2000 and the year 2014 in the four categories as designated by NHMRC, so basic science, clinical medicine and science, and public health and health services research. And you can see the increase over the 15 years in each of those four categories. Um, and then just attach the relative increases in these four categories. And I think you can see that some happy messages for clinician scientists because the increase in clinical medicine and science is twice that um, of the relative increase in basic science um, and in public and, and health services with science coming off a very low base of course it's it even double that so there's some happy messages but there are some worrying messages too because um, if we don't get these funding structures right I don't think we have them right we'll have nothing to translate in 10 and 15 years time so we have to continue to do the basic science that underpins the, the clinical science and translation that eventually public health and health services researchers will assess the validity or utility of. So I'm going to talk about preeclampsia. It's a condition of high blood pressure in pregnancy. It remains one of the leading causes of maternal death worldwide. Not so much so in Australia, but still a leading cause of maternal morbidity and is the number one cause of iatrogenic preterm birth in Australia and worldwide. And about 20 years ago, Jim Roberts, an American, Chris Redman, an, an Englishman, um, published this opinion piece in The Lancet where they distilled really um, conversations and thoughts that had been going around in the field for probably the prior five to ten years. And in, the, in their opinion piece they make this statement. They say that they think that the poorly perfused fetal placenta unit, the placenta, is the proposed origin of blood-borne materials, factors, that affect maternal systemic function by causing endothelial dysfunction. And it was the first, in black and white, um, proposition that preeclampsia was more than high, high blood pressure. That it was actually caused by underlying endothelial dysfunction. And what has become known in the field as a two-step model of preeclampsia, where the first step was inadequate placentation, implantation, leading to a placenta that sets itself up for recurrent hypoxic um, or ischemic reperfusion injury, which releases things... Um, that cause maternal endothelial dysfunction. And that endothelial dysfunction then gives rise to the signs and symptoms um, of preeclampsia that, as clinicians, we respect so much. What was unknown by Roberts and Redman at that time, and probably we still don't have a clear picture, was what those materials or factors were, and what, um, how those materials or factors might be causing the endothelial cell dysfunction in the maternal vasculature. Um, and leading on from that um, became a recognition that, that probably oxidative stress, so peroxynitrites and free oxygen-free radicals, um, were central to that endothelial dysfunction. Indeed, such was the enthusiasm for oxidative stress as the, as the end mechanism that um, about um, six or seven years later, this paper was published by Lucy Chappell and Lucille Poston um, from London, um, where they'd undertaken a very small, very modest, single centre trial in their hospital giving vitamin C and vitamin E, which was all the rage five years earlier in the cardiovascular research field um, as, uh, to improve vascular function. So they gave women at high risk of recurrent preeclampsia vitamin C and vitamin E from early pregnancy and asked, could this prevent preeclampsia? There were 280-odd women in their study. It was a randomised trial. Um, in the women who were given vitamin C, vitamin E, 8% got preeclampsia, and in the women who got placebo, 17% got preeclampsia. A significant effect. Now, the trial wasn't designed to see whether vitamin C, vitamin E would prevent preeclampsia. It was actually designed, the end point of that trial was actually markers of oxidative stress. 
um, and they were hoping to use the trial then to design a much larger trial if, if, if they showed improvement in oxidative stress markers. Actually, they didn't really show improvement in oxidative stress markers, but they did show um, a, an apparent um, halving of the risk of preeclampsia. So the field went wild. And I remember um, when the field went wild, and there were um, half a dozen very large, very expensive, multi-centre randomised trials of vitamin C and vitamin E as a primary prevention and secondary prevention for preeclampsia. The most notable of which was the same group, Lucille Poston's VIP VIP trial, published also in The Lancet um, in 2006. Big trial, 2,500 women, 25 centres, no difference in um, treatment versus placebo. In Australian dollar terms, $3 million um, cost, well actually looking at stock market yesterday, probably about $10 million cost. Um, <laughs> um, um, very expensive trial, and there were another half a dozen of these around the world, um, some published, some um, funded by NIH. What was the problem? Well, the problem was that um, the, we, didn't, the, the, we, we didn't actually understand um, the mechanisms of injury before those trials were launched. And what it's done, it, for 10 years, it has said that there is no role for antioxidants as a therapy in preeclampsia. So the antioxidant field has gone extremely quiet in preeclampsia since these trials were published 10 years ago, which is fine for some of us who are working in the field because it's left clear water for us, but actually I think it's probably put the field back 10 years because we didn't understand um, if oxidative stress was the key trigger for endothelial dysfunction, what was driving that and what the sources of those peroxynitrites or oxygen-free radicals were. Now, about 10 years ago, I went to a uh, what's best called a Lovin, a researcher's Lovin at Monash University. I, I'm not sure which dean it was that set it up. It might have been Steve, it might have been Ed, I can't remember. We had a series of um, colloquia, I guess, where people got together um, from different disciplines in our faculty, actually in cross-faculty, to try and hear about each other's work. And I, in, that, in one of those Lovins, I heard a young researcher at that time called Grant Drummond from the Department of Pharmacology, so Grant and Chris Sobey's group, um, have, have had a long-term interest in stroke, vascular health, and this family of enzymes, NATPH oxidase or NOxes, which uh, are, the, are one of the key sources of free radicals in the endothelium. And I thought, hey, I wonder if NOxes could be responsible for the free radicals that might underpin maternal endothelial dysfunction. So we set up a collaboration. Um, actually, we've had two or three grants together. And from some of that work, we, we in fact confirmed, we showed for the first time, that NOx2, one of those enzymes in the maternal endothelium, was significantly upregulated in women with preeclampsia compared to women with a normal healthy pregnancy. Here you can see the NOx expression in small vessels um, endothelium in women with preeclampsia compared to healthy controls. Why is that important? Well, Joey Granger's group in Jackson, Mississippi, had asked, using a rat model of preeclampsia, which increases NOx expression, asked whether vitamin C and vitamin E could suppress that NOx. And not surprisingly, vitamin C and vitamin E have absolutely no effect on NOx. If we had just done the rat study first, we would not have wasted millions of dollars and effort on clinicians and clinician researchers and patients having treatments in a randomised trial that we could have predicted would have been a complete waste of time. So with Grant and Chris, we went on to use a NOx um, um, enzyme um, inhibitor, apocynin, as a proof of principle. Could we, um, could we prevent or mitigate uh, in, a, in a mouse model of preeclampsia um, uh, the preeclampsia with a NOx specific inhibitor. And here you have um, blood. This is a mouse model. These are, these are um, systolic blood pressures in pregnant mice control group. Group given activin. We use activin to induce endothelial dysfunction in a preeclampsia like model. Um, and then activin with apocynin. You can see the apocynin mitigates the increased blood pressure, prevents the, the preeclampsia in this, in this mouse model. So um, using that, we then um, asked, well, I wonder whether we could use another antioxidant, a, a, an antioxidant that would be very easy to translate out into clinical practice um, as a potential therapy uh, um, for women with established preeclampsia. And what you're looking at here is a figure, actually we put in our project grant, our 
NHRC project around that year, which got funded, I'll, I'll, and I'll tell you the lesson why it got funded in a second, um, where we proposed melatonin as an antioxidant which would target NOx signalling um, as a p potential therapy for preeclampsia. So we used a different, um, these data come from another mouse model, but a different model where we used the anti-angiogenic factor, soluble FLT1, it's the um, VEGF receptor, soluble VEGF receptor, and soluble endoglin, a TGF beta co um, signalling factor to induce um, preeclampsia. And you're looking at here just melatonin levels in the mice, in mice given S flit and S and doglin. Um, um, this is an adenovirus transfection model, or given that the virus is plus melatonin, well, melatonin increases your blood levels of melatonin, it's not a big surprise. And then here in red are the blood pressures of the mice, six mice getting S flit and S and doglin. And you can see that by E13, 14, the blood pressures begin to go up. They get what looks like preeclampsia. And in black, an N of 1 um, given melatonin to suppress um, the blood pressure. Clearly the GRP was astounded and impressed by our N of 1. Um, and melatonin also, also prevents proteinuria, um, which is a, one of the hallmarks of preeclampsia. So on the basis of that, we proposed further studies of melatonin in our mouse models, um, but also a clinical trial. So we launched um, a phase one open label. I got slammed, we heard earlier about Twitter. I got slammed by, um, via Twitter for doing our open label phase one trial and not doing a pilot RCT, blinded RCT, but we chose to do this because I wanted to get um, pilot data to then fund or then um, as, as the basis of a, another application for a large RCT. So essentially the outcome of this trial is women who are coming in to Monash Medical Center with severe preeclampsia before 34 weeks, um, given melatonin, and the primary outcome of this was a duration, a, a, a prolongation of the diagnosis to delivery interval. So historically, last five years, if you look at Monash Medical Center, last five years, if you were admitted to Monash less than 34 weeks of preeclampsia, you will be delivered on average in 6.7 days. So between six and seven days. So we proposed that we could double that to 12 days. And we are, we're also looking at markers of oxygen stress, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we've confirmed, because uh, open label, so we get the results as the women come off. We've confirmed that melatonin suppresses NOx expression in the blood vessels of these women, consistent with an antioxidant effect. That's exactly what you'd expect. And then if you look in blue is the historic control. This is the, the diagnosis to delivery interval, 6.7 days historically. And then these are 12, uh, we've, got, we've now done 17 women, three to go um, in this phase one trial. Um, in green are duration, the diagnosis to delivery intervals favorable to historic control, and in red are the two women where they were not favorable compared to control. And if you just take those 12 women, we've got an average diagnosis to delivery interval of 16.9 days. What's key here is because it is an open label tr trial, and um, the researchers involved in this trial are not involved in the clinical care of the women. So they're not making, di they're not making um, decisions around delivery. So it looks like melatonin actually does have an effect in mitigating um, the disease a wee bit, um, allowing us to prolong pregnancy, which would be very, very important for the fetus and not so important for the mother. So that's one, one lesson about translation, and I, th I think it underpins the stuff we've heard already today and underpins most of what we all do. It's about understanding fundamental mechanisms, using the tools that are available to us in our very rich communities, um, our research communities, so we understand the mechanism before we go to what are very expensive clinical trials. The second um, um, example of translation um, I want to tell you about is stuff that we've been doing around preterm birth and around a, a new therapy for the treatment of preterm lung disease. So happily, the, uh, not due to my craft group, I have to say, but due to my neonatal colleagues, the survival rates from preterm birth over the last 50, 60 years since the school was established have, um, have increased dramatically, particularly in the lighter line, the survival rates for, from extreme preterm birth. So these are babies who are less than 1,000 grams um, at the time of birth. So survival rates are really, it's a completely different landscape to when this hospital opened and when, I didn't ever know we did births here, but when we did births here. Yeah. So when, you know, as we heard this morning, when babies were born here, survival rates of these babies was extremely low, and um, now it's, it's uh, very high. Now, uh, one of the challenges of those, of course, is those babies are surviving with significant morbidities. And one of the morbidities is this horrible disease called bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It's essentially arrested alveolar development and dis, um, 
um, a poor, poorly matched blood vessel development. So a disvasculature um, and an arrested alveolar development. And here are the rates of BPD, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, by gestation at birth and by birth weight. So if you're born at less than 30 weeks, roughly you've got a one in three chance of getting BPD. It's a terrible disease. And it, the, the um, mechanisms or the pathways that lead to the disease are many. So um, being born small, being born early, me requiring mechanical ventilation, and requiring high oxygen tensions in your in ventilation, and being ha having inflammation, infection before you're born as the mechanism of your preterm birth, and so on and so forth. The key thing about it is there's no cure. Um, the health burden of this is more than, um, than cystic fibrosis. Um, and as you'd expect, if you've got impaired um, 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 lung function, it's associated, very strongly associated with neurocognitive impairment as you grow up. So essentially we just support these children on ventilators, on CPAP, on decreasing oxygen tensions until they grow out of it, so to speak. So for about 10 years we've been exploring the potential use of cells derived off the placenta, actually off the amnion layer of the fetal membranes of a, of a human placenta as a stem cell therapy. And it's fair to say that when we started this journey, and Graeme Jenkins and I have been doing this together for 10 years or so, when we started this journey, um, we thought they were going to act as stem cells. And we thought we were going to act as stem cells because we just stood on the shoulders of our embryology or uh, embryonic stem cell scientists who were working at um, um, at Monash at the time, to use the recipes that they'd been using to push ES cells down different lineages. We just used those recipes for our cells, and this is work of Siva Lancharin, who's a PhD student with us at the time. And Siva showed that these cells possessed what, what then would have been um, um, considered classical markers of ES cells, so they looked like they had all the machinery to be an embryonic stem cell, and, it, um, uh, and more so, they, um, they didn't possess um, HLA markers. So these are cells that are immune privileged that look like they, they, they could behave like ES cells. If we could push them down different lineages, could we give them to any recipient? And indeed, SIVA and others um, have, have pushed these cells down every lineage that's been attempted except down, except down hematological lineages. So we have not made red blood cells or white blood cells or platelets from these cells, but every other lineage, they've been pushed down, endodermal, mesodermal, ectodermal. So you want to make pancreas, you can make pancreas, you want to make liver, you can make liver, etc. Um, at that time, um, I said to Siva, Siva, you, you really need an in vivo model as the last chapter for your thesis. And she thought, my God, my God, I've got to establish an in vivo model. Spoke to Graham. They just happened to have, in the Trouncin labs at Missile at that time, they happened to have a bleomycin model of lung injury that they were assessing mesenchymal stem cells in. And I said, oh, could we, could we then just piggyback on that and give ourselves? And here is the paper um, from that work where Eubin Moodley and Ursula Manuel Peely, who was my, my senior postdoc at the time, um, essentially gave bleomycin to adult mice, causing fibrosis. Um, and the day after giving bleomycin, gave human um, amnion epithelial cells, to, uh, which mitigated that injury. Not only mitigated the lung injury, we went on to show um, prevent, uh, protected against lung function, as assessed by plethysmography, and had this profoundly anti-inflammatory effect, so suppressed pro-inflammatory pro cytokines and increased um, or augmented anti-inflammatory um, anti cytokines. So, um, I'm not particularly interested in pulmonary fibrosis. We have ongoing work in pulmonary fibrosis with colleagues in Brisbane, but I'm an obstetrician. The lung disease I'm interested in is BPD because th those are what my patients get. And so we set about creating animal models of all the key pathways to injury, hyperoxia, ventilation-induced injury, and infection. And indeed, we published a whole series of papers, and here are three of them against each of those pathways. Um, um, notably, that the lead authors in all of these papers are, are clinicians. Trish Fostaganis was a BMED Sci student who went on to do a PhD. Ryan Hodges was a clinical tra trainee who went on to do a PhD with us, um, assessing infection, inflammation, hyperoxia. Um, and I'll show you just data from one of those experiments because the results are all the same. This is um, Ryan's work, ventilation-induced lung injury, looking at a fetal lamb head coming through maternal abdomen. So this is, the, this is the uterus here, this pink tissue. The U is on her back. We put a uh, ventilation tube down, so an, uh, a modified ET tube. 
um, and then put the lamb back in, sew up the uterus, and here is the U now connected to a standard um, neonatal ventilator, and we can ventilate the lamb and cause lamb injury, uh, lung injury, and then study the lung injury. And here, is, here are some, um, here are some uh, pictures. This is normal lamb lung, stained for collagen and elastin. Um, here is a lamb that 12 days ago um, was ventilated, uh, sorry, seven days ago, was ventilated for 12 hours. So during seven day, for seven days ago, we ventilated this lamb for 12 hours, and you can see we've caused um, this damage, this, this increased collagen, increased fibrosis, increased elastin, and we've lost um, tissue, we've lost um, airspace. So the tissue to airspace ratio has gone up. There's more tissue and less airspace. It's not good for you if you're a lung. And here is the pictures and the data from, um, from the lambs that um, received human amnion epithelial cells during the 12 hours of their ventilation. You can see that amnion cells pre protected against the loss of airspace, it decreased collagen, it decreased elastin, and most importantly, it protected against the loss of these so-called secondary septal crests. So these little black things here on the end are the secondary septal crests that will form tomorrow's alveoli. And if you knock those off, you can't form a new alveoli tomorrow. Ventilation knocks those off. Amnion cells protects against that knockoff. So um, through those models, we then, um, I, I think we developed enough evidence that the cells were a potential therapy for bronchopramic dysplasia. Um, and so from day one almost, um, when we started getting the bleomycin results, we began a pathway and we had conversations with TGA way back then, before TGA knew what it was going to do with cell therapies, and um, we, we planned a pathway that would take us to clinical trial. And one of the things that the new um, TGA requirements asks of us is you should at least have a basic grasp of how the cells might work. Now you don't actually have to understand exactly how they work, but you should have a broad idea. Now, we, it's fair to say when we started this, we thought they were going to work by differentiating into lung cells or brain cells or whatever. Very early on, we learned that wasn't the case. Um, and we, we undertook a series of experiments, almost exclusively using the bleomycin model because it was so easy to use, to unpick the pathways. And, um, and, and we published a whole um, series of papers on that. And just to summarize where we got on that, um, it looks like the amnion cells are affecting the repair um, and, and preventing injury through modification of the host immune cell response. So they're modifying, they're pushing T cells down to um, T reg pathways and both, both via T regs and independently pushing macrophages from a pro injury, so M1 type phenotype, to a pro reparative M2 ish type phenotype. So, all of the effects of amnion cells are dependent on host immune cell responses and modification of that, except for one. And this is work that is really just coming off now. Dan Dan Zhu, current um, Chinese clinician, so she's an ONG clinician in China, doing a PhD with Rebecca Lim and I. And Dan Dan's being asking, could the amnion cells be triggering niche lung progenitor cells? So could, could the amnion cells be encouraging the stem cells within the lung niche to um, to proliferate. And what you're looking at here are lungs in our bleomycin model. These are, lung, these are mice, mouse lungs um, um, labeled for markers of bronchialveolar stem cells. And what I hope you can see is that the animals given bleomycin and cells, compared to animals given bleomycin alone, have much more bronchialveolar stem cells as designated by the pink um, staining. And just to confirm that, Dan Dan has taken um, bronchoalveolar stem cells from a GFP mouse and cultured them in vitro in the presence or absence of amnion cells and they form these little bronchoalveolar clusters, they're beautiful things to look at down the, microso down the microscope and what Dan Dan has shown is that if you culture um, um, these bronchoalveolar stem cells in vitro in the presence or absence of amnion cells the amnion cells encourage a much more rapid proliferation, suggesting they are switching on um, these stem cell niches. We're just exploring the cellular pathways by which that is achieved. Um, we've also used these studies, I have to say, to address other requirements of TGA dose finding studies. So we, we know the number of cells we should be giving. We know the timing of administration of the cells. We know the route of administration of the cells to achieve optimum effects. Um, which then takes us to the last thing, which was clinical safety and 
Last year, we registered and got ethics approval to do a phase one trial, safety trial of amnion cells um, in babies with established BPDs. This is first in human. Um, that trial um, started this year. We've treated our first babies. The cells are prepared at St. Vincent's um, through a facility that was funded by something that Graeme Jenkin and I um, established and, and lead the Victorian Consortium for Cell Therapies. We put a, a, a unit in at St. V's, we put a unit in at Monash. The cells are prepared under TGA, um, GMP um, conditions and allows us to give them to babies. And we hope to finish this trial maybe by end of this year or first quarter next year, which will then take us on to a phase two trial. Um, as we're doing that through another project grant with collaborators in Perth, we're looking at longer term effects using LAMS to understand um, better, you know, to try and optimize the administration of the cells so we can anticipate which are the best candidates which would form um, the, um, the subjects in our phase two trial. So what I've done is give you a very whirlwind, trying to finish on time, whirlwind tour of how we do what we do. It's more about how we do it rather than what we do, it, although, of course, what we do is pretty exciting, I think. Um, and some of the lessons that we've learned, and I think we've heard already this morning um, from others, the qu you know, our questions are clinically focused, and they have to be worth asking. If they're not worth asking, then it's not waste time on developing models of them. We spend a lot of energy trying to develop models with high fidelity that allow us to understand mechanisms before we go to clinic, because clinic is so, so time um, um, expensive and so dollar expensive. Um, and I think, and I, what I hope I've given you a sense of is that in both of the examples that, of the work that we do, um, what has underpinned them is an access to an exposure to multidisciplinary expertise. So our knock stuff would never have happened had it not been for that love in. Our ventilation would never have been possible without Stuart Hooper's group. Um, our stem cell stuff would never have been possible without the lessons learned from EA cell biologists that we continue to learn from them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is the function of universities to allow us, uh, to, to give us that environment and the collective efforts and capability. And this ongoing dialogue, this two-way conversation with clinical and preclinical studies running in parallel. Thank you very much for your attention. I just want to acknowledge all the people both in the Ritchie Centre, in my department, and all of our collaborators who do all this work. Thank you very much.